I mean, you probably sit here now at the age you're at thinking, oh, if only I'd known now what, or only if I'd known then what I know now as the England manager, I would have done this differently at Middlesbrough. I would have done that as a player at Palace or Aston Villa. But the fact that you went through those experiences means you're now able to sit here and reflect on that. That's the point, isn't it? Those difficult periods are the periods of growth, basically. How can you possibly know? And of course, you're then dismissed as a... Did you think you were prepared? Because sometimes if you don't know what you don't know, it's kind of healthy. Well, that's true. You, you certainly think you're better prepared than you actually are. Um, yeah. And it, and now I look at what I know now and how much I still feel I've got to improve to to be the best. And so you know how far off you were then. Yeah. But also, I also know we were doing a lot of things right. And because you didn't have the evidence that that was going to get results... And maybe in football, sometimes you, there are times where you do all the things right and you still don't get the result because it's such a low scoring game. Um, so you're doubting yourself. And of course, we're in a world where everybody else is certainly doubting you as well. Whereas now you've got 10 years more experience. So yeah, to, it's like comparing myself as a 17 year old player com as an apprentice to a 25 year old international. As a coach and manager at 35 with no, not a day's experience, how could I have known everything I needed to know? There was a question that really intrigued me on this card that I remember watching you. At, um, there was an FA Cup game at Manchester United where you played them a couple of days after playing them in the league. And I remember being at that game and seeing you and you looked like somebody that just wasn't enjoying it. You looked very different from the sort of public perception that I'd had of you. And yet when I see you now, say, in the effort, in the World Cup semi-final, you look a lot calmer, you look, look more in control. So in that period from being a manager then to now what you know, how what would you say has been the biggest learning that you've that, that you've acquired in that time? That's a great question. Um, because I think there's so much. Um, Is Damien right, by the way? Are you different now? Yeah, because the level of stress then was enormous because everything I was going into was new. So I'd never planned a training session really with senior players. I'd taken my, uh, I was working through my A license with junior players. I'd never managed a group of staff, never had to deal with a transfer market, never had to deal with agents, never managed a board or you don't manage a board, but manage up. worked with a yeah. board. Um, not totally clear on the style of play in every detail that we wanted. So then what does that need to look like on the training ground? So again, I was fortunate. I had some really fantastic people with me, experienced coaches, Steve Harrison, Malcolm Crosby, Steve Round, Paul Barron. So they carried me really through a lot of that. I had the respect of the players because I'd been their captain, but of course, total change of dynamic because within days I'm having to make decisions on contracts and... So the le when I look back, the level of stress, because everything's new and it's a hundred mile an hour and every situation is different. Yeah, it, it, once I'd lost the role, I remember Steve Gibson saying to me, you, you might feel relieved that this has happened. And of course you're bullish and you think, ah, no, you know, nonsense. And then probably a, a, a week or so later, I was thinking, I don't, I don't miss being in that situation. And for a long time, I didn't think I would want to go back into managing because I think the brain is scarred and you don't want to go, you know, you don't put your hand on the fireplace, on the fire again, do you? So I, I don't want to feel that. Um, but then I started to do some work with the FA on youth development and building St. George's and it sort of rekindled my hunger for football and because of the different experiences I had covering games with television, I knew the fulfillment would be coaching, helping other people to achieve, putting something in. Um, and also, you know, a lot of the time we have a view on how things should be and we fire those views in from the outside. And Well, okay, if you want to make a difference to youth development in England, then get on with it. Don't just stand on the side, crack on. Um, and so through that process, I went and saw loads of different things. I learned a lot more about young player development. I learned a lot more about elite environments. I learned a lot more about my, myself, my strengths, my weaknesses. So, yeah, and from 
from there I just recognize that every day you're learning new things and and trying to improve in every area really so would you tell us a bit about the public and private perception of you as a head coach and Gareth because that famous quote was attributed to you I think it was about Sven Goran Eriksson <laughs> of we wanted Churchill and we got Ian Duncan Smith how would you describe you as a coach then into, and where are you on that scale yeah I, I think that was Martin Keown, by the way. What but, was it? Passing the but, back. Come on, no, take but, responsibility. But I quite liked the quote. I'm, I'm sure Ian Duncan Smith wasn't very happy about it, by <laughs> yeah. the way. So what would I think of that quote now? I'd be appalled by it because what I recognise is that Sven was being authentic. Right. You know, he was a calm demeanour. What he brought to the England team where um, Kevin had been a different type of leader, more emotional... Sven was very calm and I think that helped people like Stephen Gerrard, David Beckham, certainly in the initial stages with England that a lot of the noise, the hullabaloo around England was calmer. We're just focusing on performance. It's not all about banging the drum and we, we're going to win and we're going to do this. So he created that environment and therefore, why is he going to be different at half time in a game? He was that that's how he was and he worked in that way um so i've got you know what i know is i've got to be authentic to myself yeah i think in being authentic to myself i think there are different approaches you use at different times you know there are rare occasions i think it's rare because i don't think people respond to raised voices as much or aggressive challenge but there are moments where that has to happen i think in the dressing room to you might need a, a response of energy or and you've got to shake people out of the psychological state they're in but you've done that for a reason it's not that you've lost the plot at half time and you're going in with a purpose and you know what reaction you're trying to get so i, th I think you've got to have different approaches yeah. with different players at different times and find out what they respond to and and how can we get the best out of individuals because i know that some wouldn't be able to handle that perhaps so i'm going to have to i'm going to have to approach that differently someone really short sharp no fluff yeah. you know don't don't give me any nonsense just straight on the line uh, others want me to you know lead in with a softly <laughs> softly approach deliver the the difficult conversation on come on this needs to be better and then fluff it in a praise sandwich or whatever we would call it but some don't want that you know so would you deliver then two or three half-time team talks to different pockets of of that dressing room no we would deliver one talk but the approach we might take and again steve will speak at half time as well so right. he'll follow my message and he'll he'll pick up on the bits that i miss or he'll take a slightly different approach with somebody and yeah, it's it, 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 again your your short period of time, so you need real clarity on the messaging, but also what emotional state are we trying to provoke in the team to start the second half? Um, and they're all the considerations I think of of a coaching team when you're when you're right. dealing in that space at half time. And do you tend at half time to be head or heart? Like, are you sort your tactics out? Or are you more about fight and spirit to the players? I think, it, I think, I think the first point has got to be. I think sometimes heart can be overplayed. You know, I was very much heart as a player, and that's why I like I loved Terry. Terry broke that down, and normally issues in games, the fans will often watch a game and say, "Oh, they weren't trying. They'd given up. They're not fit." And actually, normally, there's a tactical problem that the team is struggling to resolve and it means that the game is not going well and therefore the energy is sucking out of them because they're losing belief. So the legs aren't taking them because I've, I've been that soldier. <laughs> Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast 
make a real difference to the world. See you soon.